should uh, start it by saying that uh, we have a serious problem uh, in the command and service module. We appear to have had some kind of uh, accident with the uh, in the region of the fuel cells and the oxygen tanks. We have not tried too much to reconstruct the uh, what has happened because we're more concerned at the moment for getting the situation under control. Uh, as you have seen, we've uh, begun to use the uh, limb as a device for keeping oxygen in both the command and service command module and the lunar module, and we're using the power system from the lunar module. Uh, the, it appears at the present time that everything is under control and that uh, we have a safe situation at the moment. Uh, I think uh, Colonel McDivitt may want to give you some more details on the systems and uh, Mr. Schoberg could certainly talk about the operations plans that are going on at the present time in the control center. All right, Chris. The way we have the spacecraft configured right now is uh, with the CSM powered down completely. Uh, before we powered it down, we were able to isolate the surge tank and the emergency repress tanks in the CS in the command module. Uh, these provide oxygen for reentry, so we have a a command module that has oxygen for reentry, it has the reentry batteries, it has pyro batteries, and all the systems uh, that are in the command module. Our uh, malfunction uh, apparently occurred in the bay, which which includes the hydrogen tanks, the oxygen tanks, and the fuel cells, and uh, was in no way connected with anything with the command module. We should be able to provide power, electrical power, from the LEM for the uh, return voyage to Earth. Uh, we should re be able to return on the oxygen within the limb, and we'll be using the lithium hydroxide out of both the command module and the uh, lunar module. We can still power the command module from the lunar module at uh, low power levels through the wiring, which is normally used to power the limb from the command module. So we expect that we'll be using a dual spacecraft mode from now until the time that we uh, get back to Earth. Uh, we will have to, we'll be firing the LEM engine uh, at some time later to accelerate our return voyage, and I think Sig probably comment on that best. Uh, yeah, the uh, minimum return to Earth time, this would be a total flight duration, would be about 133 hours. That would result in a landing in the Atlantic. That's one option we have. A second option would be to go to the uh, the Pacific line, that would take about uh, 142 hours uh, total flight duration. The burns to get you back would be made at about between 77 hours and 79 hours of, of uh, flight from liftoff. Uh, we'd anticipate that the Eastern propulsion system would be used for the maneuvers and has the capability, these are the ones I described. Yeah. Ready for questions now? Please wait for the mic, we're gonna to have to get all this in. <laughs> where are we? Are you ready? Let's, let's start here and work across. Mark Bloom, then we'll go this way and we'll turn over to the aisle. Uh, for Jim and David, or anyone who wants to ask, how much electrical life power at a time, lifetime, do we have in the LEM, and how much oxygen lifetime? How long do we have? Well, Mark, it depends upon how we use it, obviously. We have four batteries in the descent stage of the LEM with 400 amp hours each. We have uh, two batteries in the ascent stage with 296 amp hours each. If you rough that out quickly, it says we can use power at about 25 amps uh, steady state current until we get back. Now, we'll have to um, arrange the electrical profile so that we can bring up the systems to perform the dock DPS maneuver and then we'll power down to minimum levels and go along like that. When I left we had an ample power supply to do the whole mission but we were still roughing it out and trying to get in a configuration which we knew. Oxygen, we have 48 pounds of oxygen in the, in the uh, LEM descent tanks which is more than adequate to do the mission. We also have a couple pounds in the, in the LEM ascent tanks. Uh, 
I, I think I said decent. Decent tank has 48 pounds. The SN tanks have about a pound or so. The point is that we have locked up the CSM systems to preserve that spacecraft for reentry, both in terms of power and, and oxygen. So uh, it, it is sufficient to support entry. The uh, lodge is completely intact. There's no problem with it at all. I wonder if we can expand a little more on the possibility of an Atlantic uh, Ocean landing and what the recovery posture is for the Atlantic. Uh, for an Atlantic landing, we would have airplanes with para-jumpers on the scene at the time of landing. We're presently uh, surveying that area of the Atlantic. It's, as I remember, it's about uh, 20 or 25 degrees south and about, uh, well, I think it's about 25 or 30 degrees west longitude. And we're presently uh, surveying the area for ships of opportunity. But we we do not have a planned recovery ship in that area, as you know. Well, would you, let, me, let me follow up on that. Would you say that now it seems a great deal more likely that you'd go for 142 hours and the Pacific where you have a recovery capability? Uh, I think that's a good possibility, but I'd like to reserve judgment until I see what happens in the next hours. We have some uh, 18 or 19 hours until that uh, burn has to be made, so I think we'd certainly be watching the situation. The Pacific is a lot better from from, uh, from the standpoint that we have the ship there. It's better from a, a network standpoint. So it's a preferred place, even though it might take a little longer. Uh, Chris or Jim, can you tell us where the uh, three astronauts are and how they will be living in their return to Earth? Well, when I left, <clears throat> I think that Jack Swigert was still in the command module and uh, Jim and Fred were in the limb, and I think that they'll be living between the two spacecraft until uh, uh, they return. Uh, sometime uh, before reentry, of course, the three of them will return to the command module and put the hatch back in and jettison the limb, jettison the service module. If I were going to, I were going to guess. I'd guess that uh, two of them would sleep in the CSM while the other one stayed awake in the limb. I, I would guess that they'll probably go to some kind of shift like that. Yeah. And I followed up. How are they going to be getting oxygen and heat and in, in, in the uh, command module from the limb? Uh, to, we're going to be running one environmental control system or the other. Initially, we'll be running the limb system. That's what we're running right now. Now, uh, intermittently, we'll run the CSM system to make sure that we keep the uh, atmosphere in the limb uh, free of carbon dioxide. So we'll be alternating. That's why I say there'll be people in both spacecraft. That was picture over here, and we'll come back. On this far side. Right there, yeah. Yeah, well, somebody explain to me what you mean by a ship of opportunity in the Atlantic. Is that some merchant ship, a Russian sub that happens to be? It could be a merchant ship. It could be. Uh, uh, I suppose it could be a foreign nation's naval vessel, any of that kind of thing. You mean any ship in the United States? Yes, sir. Right here. Uh, Chris, has this abort situation or altered uh, trajectory ever been run on simulators in just oh. this way? Oh, yes. Uh, many times we run all kinds of abort situations. And and uh, if you recall, in, uh, in Colonel McDivitt's flight, we actually burned the uh, DIPS engine attached to the command and service module. The, the uh, autopilot in the lunar module is designed to carry out the maneuver under those circumstances. That is, the digital autopilot to damp the, the oscillations of the combined spacecraft. Uh, we are looking even at uh, the possibilities of dropping the service module, but that particular type of, of maneuver has not been tested in flight, and we'd have to make ourselves certain that uh, we could control the spacecraft under that kind of CG and inertia condition. So yeah, that's kind of unlikely that we would do that. We, if we did that, it would give us that much more delta V, you see, because we'd get rid of quite a bit of weight from the uh, CSM. Jack Strickland? Uh, uh, Chris or Jim, uh if you've got a situation where the limb oxygen system can provide like a 50 plus hours for two guys, uh, how do you equate that with 146 hours of return if you don't have any kind of environmental control uh, uh, operation in the command module right now? Normally, we on the lunar surface, we plan on three uh, lunar surface repressurizations. It actually has enough for four. Now, there's about 6.6 .6 pounds of oxygen per repressurization required. And the, and the limb leak rate is about uh, 0.08 pounds per hour. 
and the metabolic rate is a little bit, and we're using probably two tenths of a pound per hour, so we've got uh, quite a large margin there. You recharge the uh, pluses also. Pardon? Let's get this straight if we can. You use, you're saying you use two tenths of a pound per man per hour? A better, number, a better number is six to eight pounds for the three men per day. Six to eight pounds for all? Correct, and yeah. that plus what you, you have might to, have for... Uh, yeah, you have to take in that cabin leakage, too. All right. If, if I can follow up here just a second. Have you got enough, enough oxygen to get them back safely? Yes. All right, over here. According to the press handouts, the Navy's got a standby task force in the Atlantic to recover if necessary. You wouldn't go to this, you'd go to the ship of opportunity, emergency ship if necessary? We don't have a U.S. Navy recovery ship in the Atlantic. Is deemed necessary for this mission? It was not deemed necessary for this mission. Say, so where were the... Where was the Atlantic recovery point again, uh, geographically, if you could, uh, uh, and the Pacific? This is, this is uh, rough, Paul, but it's something like 20 to 25 degrees south latitude, and I think it's about 30 degrees west longitude. Just below the point of South America there, Paul. The bulge in that area, due south of that. Uh, you mentioned uh, that, that you should be able to generate around 25 amps per hour, uh, and you have to divide that out against the loads. Will there be sufficient power for the transponders so that you can get a good track on the uh, spacecraft? Uh, I will be able to bring them up uh, when we need to, and I believe that we'll have that kind of power. I really don't have that close a handle on the power. I, we came over here before we had all those details worked out to that well, level. As long as it, with the uh, Omnis and the uh, 220 foot dishes, I don't think we'll have any problem. Either. Also, I, I appreciate that you haven't been able to give any uh, thought to uh, what caused all this, but there, I was looking through the transcript and there, there were certain problems with the O2 uh, tanks and uh, the cryo temperatures and uh, problems with cycle, fan cycling and stratification. Because this, uh, apparently one of the tanks was oscillating very rapidly in temperature, and this was noted earlier today. Uh, does this give you uh, any uh, any thought of what might have happened? No, not yet. Uh, stratification is something that typically happens in these tanks, and it's nothing that we haven't seen before. Uh, right now, I have absolutely no clue to what happened. We had something... It was pretty rather, widespread, we know. Rather violent happened in Bay 4, we think. It, something happened to the fuel cells in the oxygen tank, and, and they were down in that area. It was a rather violent kind of thing because it apparently reset some of the check valves in the RCS quads, which are susceptible to shock. But as far as what exactly happened, I have no idea. Uh, Chris, are, are you confident that you have enough power under the current, current configuration to, to bring the, the uh, Apollo back in? Yes, but I think we'll have to be very frugal in how we use it, and that's what you probably heard some of the discussions uh, uh, back and forth between the crew. We, we were trying to consider whether we would keep the platform up, for instance, between now and the time you go behind the moon in order to maintain that alignment so that they wouldn't have to do another alignment when they get ready to do the burn on the dips and so on. So it will have to be very carefully used between here and the, and the splash. And, and how do you feel in point of concern between now and Gemini 8? Well, I, I guess I would have to say I feel a great deal more concerned. We're, uh, we're still something like... Uh, 70 to 80 hours away from the earth and in gemini 8 we were never more than an hour and a half to get to a recovery point and never more than 20 minutes to land carl will take one back in and look at this thing at the time that you left what was the situation with regard to venting to the outside and motions of the spacecraft from that was there any not I don't know. I can't, I, I the, can't venting had, the venting had been decreasing, and if we were leaking probably from that bay, and if it looked like the pressures were all dropping, so I would assume that the venting had gone down, but it was a little difficult to tell from the, the conversation. I would assume that the venting had decreased considerably. Are you were not getting any particular rates anymore at the time you were leaving? 
<clears throat> not that I recall. I think they had the uh, LEM RCS uh, system up, and so it would be difficult to tell even then whether they did have any rates. Uh, they were transitioning from one, one spacecraft control system to another and, and running back and forth through the tunnel and aligning the platform. There's an awful lot of activity going on, and we didn't ask them what the rates were. I believe I heard uh, Fred Hayes mention that uh, it might be considered to use a deep space abort in order to uh, immediately get the burn over with and power down the limb so you wouldn't have that drain in keeping it powered up till they get around the moon. Has this been completely disregarded now? We can't. Uh, the position we are now on the Earth moon plane, we have to go around the, the, uh, the moon to get back if we're going to use the fixed engine. You would have had enough capability with the SBS engine, but of course we don't dare use that now. So we have to go to the back side of the moon and come back. I have a question in three parts. First of all, if they do uh, choose the Pacific method of recovery, will the recovery point be changed from original planning or will it still be the same? I think it, it's uh, moved west and south some. I think it's about 165 degrees west and uh, some 20 degrees south. It, it is farther south and farther west than the end of mission. Plan. With this, uh, the other two questions uh, kind of combined. Uh, if you did it landed in the, in the Atlantic and you did uh, have to go to a ship of opportunity, would you hesitate at all to ask any ship of any nation? No, sir, I wouldn't. Will this necessitate uh, future thinking toward a backup recovery uh, fleet in the in the Atlantic? We certainly will reassess that, yes, sir. That was the back there. Uh, Chris, will you come in at 400K, and uh, will there be any problem in jettisoning the uh, lamb you know, and uh, entry? Or, or all that what done. will be that mechanic, sir? It, it's done the same way as it is around the moon, and the same way coming back from, uh, from the from the moon with the service module. You have pyrotechnic batteries and separate pyrotechnic uh, lines, electrical sources, which uh, are dependent only on those power sources. So uh, we don't have any problems there in terms of uh, separation. Now, the, uh, the dynamics, mechanics of the thing would not be a problem either. Uh, for, for Jim McDivitt, uh, uh, is, is a situation like occurred in Bay 4 something that might have occurred if it was hit by a, uh, a meteoroid. And for uh, Chris Kraft, and, and following up your earlier comments, uh, uh, do, you, do you feel they have a good chance to make it back? Well, you asked me first. It was, <clears throat> there was something uh, which appeared to be quite violent that occurred in Bay 4, and yes, if you were stuck by a meteor, it would be quite violent. Uh, I'm not assuming that's what happened, Mark, but that could have done it. Yes, I think their chances are excellent at the moment, assuming that the lunar module continues to operate well. Uh, can you think of anything else that might cause such a violent event as besides a meteor? Yeah. Well, we could probably think of an infinite number of things that could... Well, two or three that would be well, within the realms of likelihood, I mean. I guess I, I really... There are a lot of things that could have happened. It would be just pure conjecture. Anything that's down there that's pressurized could have let go, and there are all kinds of pressurized things. There are pressurized hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fuel cells. Uh, it's a very complicated bay that, that this happened in. Very good. Uh, what is the moment that you have to uh, get everybody out of the limb and back into the command module and seal it off and uh, and get ready for entry? I mean, what, how late can you get in, can you use the limb before you, you have to go to the batteries on the command module? It's pretty late. It doesn't take too long to uh, get back in the CSM. The thing that you want to make sure is that uh, you have adequate time to put the hatch in and blow the limb off, and that really doesn't take very long. I'm uh, sure that will be a process where yeah. a couple of them will get back in the CSM, get everything set up, and they'll do that as late as possible. I guess uh, we'd have to work that out. 30 minutes or hour or 15 minutes or some range like that. We want to start using the CSM batteries as late as possible. Okay, we're going to come up the middle of Harry. Uh, uh, on the present trajectory, how far beyond the moon will they go before they start to hook back? And what would the missed distance at the Earth be without a correcting burn from the dips? 
Well, the present traject trajectory, we would come within about 60 nautical miles of the back side of the moon. We are not on a free return trajectory at present. Uh, it would take a very small burn, say in the next five or 10 hours, to get us back on a free return in the order of 20 to 40 feet per second. I can't answer your second question about how far we miss. I don't know. Right here. Uh, will the dip spurn be the major rocket maneuver you will make on coming back? And if so, where will it be? On the far side of the moon? Or It'll be, be on the far side. Yes, it will be the dips. It will be on the some some place between Paraloon on the far side of the moon and uh, two hours after that. Just pick these up coming up the middle of the aisle. We'll just take them both sides again. All right. Do you recall the, my, the um, approximate mileage at which point you can still do a deep space abort and come back? Uh, what is the crossover? 140, 150,000? It's probably farther than that, Paul. I don't remember the exact number, but if, uh, I think at the time of this incident, if you'd used the, the SPS engine, you could just about have done it, but it would have taken just about the whole thing. 176,000, something like that. Yeah. If I recall, Paul, I think the number was 9,000 foot per yeah. second in, in about 140 hours. What, what would cause you to choose the Atlantic over the Pacific for recovery? And are you now surveying the Atlantic to find out what ships are available to you? Uh, yes, we are surveying the Atlantic to find out what ships are available. Uh, I think the only reason you go to the, the Atlantic, if sometime between now and the burn, something would happen to make you very time critical in getting back. Burn more quickly or sooner? No, it's a bigger burn to go to the Atlantic. It's about uh, 2,000 or 1,900 feet per second and get you back uh, some nine hours earlier. How many feet per second? It's about 900. Let's come up to here. We have the gentleman in, this, in the middle of the room there, in the, in the khaki jacket. Um, in the transcript, um, I'd like to read from this. Uh, Lovell says, um, yes, um, I've got to put the cabin refrink valve in there. Every time he does that, our hearts jump in our mouths. Now, I don't understand what he's talking about here, but could this have anything to do with the, with the accident? If, if something happened that made their hearts jump in their mouths, what was it? Uh, I think he's talking about the cam repress valve and the limb, which goes bang when you operate it. Well, uh, McDivitt uh, said that uh, any pressurization could do anything. Is there any link here? Any pressure? Uh, no. I guess I don't understand uh, the question. It didn't, the, what you're asking is, did that uh, statement have anything to do with the accident, and I think oh, definitely no. not. So he was talking about something that went on in the lunar module as opposed to the, where the accident occurred in the command service module. I'd like to go back to uh, Bay 4. Uh, do you expect to be able to tell exactly what happened there, and if so, how soon? Well, we have people working at it right now, and I don't know whether we'll ever be able to tell exactly what happened there or not. We're reducing the data like we do on all of the, on the space flights and whenever we have an anomaly. And uh, to date, we've been quite successful in determining what happened. Whether or not we are in this case, I have no idea. We're certainly going to do the best job that we can. Well, sometimes it takes a long time. I have no idea on this. I haven't seen the data myself at all. We were trying to figure out what to do rather than to, to, uh, to play out the old data. And that's what we'll be doing till we get them back on the water, is concentrating on everything that is de their, their lives are dependent upon at the moment rather than worrying about the accident, because there's nothing we can do about that now. This service module is no longer useful in most cases because the oxygen is depleted. So uh, other than the fact that you've got uh, propuls some propulsion left and uh, the batteries in the command module, and uh, we're going to worry about those situations from now to splash. Initially, we were, we were trying to find out what was wrong down there so we could possibly correct it before we lost the oxygen. We weren't able to do that in time, and I think that we'll put that effort on a very low priority right now and work on the other stuff. Pardon? Any, no, no hints. What about your thermal control situation? The uh, 
Do you expect any problems from heat because of your configuration now? Well, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to just maintain a single attitude hold all the way to the moon and back. Uh, we're going to do something. And we're, we've been working on that. I guess the guys are working on that now, aren't they? Yes, I don't think we can answer that question truthfully because we've never had a situation where we had not had powered up conditions in the command module and, and powered conditions in the LEMS. So it, uh, that's probably going to be a real-time situation. Chris, uh, at the risk of asking you to oversimplify a very complex situation, and uh, certainly I don't mean this facetiously, is there any concern, real concern, can you get them back, taking into consideration all the imponderables, the, the power, the oxygen, the landing area, and all this sort of thing? Is this, If the situation remains stable as it is at the moment, there's no question but what we have the thing under control and we can return the crew safely to the earth. Now, we're going to have to make some compromises and procedures as how you do that, uh, but that can be done. We've got a number of different ways of doing things, like re-entry. If we couldn't, for instance, get the platform up, we have the what we call the entry monitoring system. We can enter, enter at constant G if we had to with, with no entry monitoring system. If everything remains as is, uh, we can get them back successful. Now, if there was some change in the status of the lunar module, then that might that might mean something else, and we will keep you appraised of that situation. Okay, right here, the anticipate that might happen that already hasn't happened. Can you, can you give us an indication of what could happen? For well, the you, you might have some problem with some system in the lunar module that would put us in a very serious situation, like a leak in the oxygen system or uh, something that would happen to the electrical power. There's no indication now that there's anything wrong with the limb. It's performing properly, and the, like Chris said, if everything works the way it is now, there's no doubt that they'll come back all right. Great. What time did the accident occur? Mm. I don't have an exact time. Yes, must something like 50, 56 hours. Yeah, 55 and a half to 56 hours in that time period. I didn't... All right. Marshall. The crew be in the, wearing their space suits, or will they be shirt sleeve, or how will they be traveling the rest of the trip? Well, they're shirt sleeves right now. I would guess they'd probably stay shirt sleeves. I see no reason to go back to the suits. Yes, yes. All right, we're going to take these two here, and we're going to go back on this side. Uh, Jim, I'm not clear on what the vetting did to the uh, spacecraft's attitude and pitch uh, roll in your... Well, he had a negative pitch and a negative roll, and... Uh, that's one of the clues that we had that something happened in Bay 4 in addition to the fact that we had all these other anomalies to the equipment that's in there. It meant that it was pitching the nose down and it was rolling to the left. I think the other thing you have to remember is that uh, we have certain instrumentation that uh, we can believe or not believe. I mean by that that when you have something like this happen, you don't know that you're not reading false information from some of the instruments. So you have to look at those and see how they failed, et cetera, and see what the measurements are and see which direction they went when they began to fail to see whether that you're reading true information. All right, just one, and then we're going to come back on. Uh, Chris, could you uh, put this in a, a somewhat larger perspective? Uh, it seems, obviously, that if this happened on the way back, the, the situation would be critical. I mean, it would be fatal. Indeed, it would. Uh, you discuss uh, this thing from the standpoint of... Uh, the resources you're left with uh, when it fails at this point in the mission? Well, at any time uh, that you still have the lunar module in the condition that we have it in in this case, where we've not used any of its uh, consumables, uh, and then we're in a very good situation. We've always called the LEM a good lifeboat under those circumstances. If at any time in the mission, however, the LEM had separated and we had gotten ourselves into a rendezvous situation, or uh, the, the command module being around the moon, then what you state is absolutely true. It would, it would be a fatal situation. What is the critical consumable? Water, lithium hydroxide, oxygen, electrical power, or what? And how long will it last? Well, the, as I mentioned earlier, it, it varies on how you use them. If you turn everything off, then electrical power is not a problem. But of course, we have to use it. Uh, oxygen, we have more than a sufficient quantity, and the limb is self 
sufficient except for the lithium hydroxide. We're going to have to be using lithium hydroxide out of the CSM to maintain the CO2 level at a lower level. So uh, from that standpoint, we have to use both the command module and the LEM. Uh, from an electrical standpoint and an oxygen standpoint, we can use the LEM alone. Enough water? Yes. When the fuel cells aren't functioning? Yes, the LEM has a large amount of water that it carries. The LEM cooling is done by um, water. It uses a sublimator rather than radiators, so we'd be using that water for cooling, and there is enough. The, the individual uh, life support system packs that were meant for the moonwalk, can they be used inside of the spaceship? Yes. Thank you. Right, the very back there? Pentagon given to cutting down communications to conserve electrical power, to setting a timeline of, of we'll talk to you with us and so at such hour. I don't think it makes that much difference. Uh, and I don't, at this time, I don't think we think we have to do that. Right. Initially, we wanted to get the spacecraft configuration under control so we knew where we were. And as I said, we've got to average about 25 amps or something on that order, plus or minus a few amps. And it's better to burn a few extra amps right now, figure out what you're going to do, and have all the capability of, of taking things out later. But you want to make sure that you've got a condition you can live with now. I might say that if, if when we're in a condition where we don't have the 220-foot dish, uh, communications may be somewhat sporadic without the high-gain antenna, which we would probably not want to bring up because of power reasons in the land. Um, I know it's probably a little premature, but um, seeing they have had a, a rough time, have you worked out um, any schedule for um, a sleep period for any of the astronauts? No, I think this is a little premature for that. <laughs> Mary? Um, Chris, if the LEM continues to operate well, uh, what is your, you know, on the, the systems and the power and all that kind of jazz, uh, what is your primary concern? Do you have any concern about the spacecraft, you know, things working sufficiently in it to bring it back? No. Uh, I think that um, with the ground situation that we have, that is the tracking we have from the ground, the maneuvers that we can give them from the ground, uh, I think that we're perfectly satisfied that that situation is well under control. But extreme weather conditions uh, affect your choice of landing sites, and do you have any idea what the weather will be like in the landing sites? I haven't looked at the weather yet, but these, we would still have uh, range control during reentry, some hundreds of miles, <laughs> perhaps a thousand. What will the procedures be for the rest of the night? They are not defined yet. All right. Chris, you were in a catbird seat on John Glenn in a retro pack that didn't come off. Scott Carpenter in an overshoe. Dave Scott in a stuck thruster. Uh, how would you, and forgive me if I put you on a spot, but how would you classify this situation? As regards to these that we are familiar with a little bit. Well, I'd, I'd say this is as serious a situation as we have ever, we have ever had in manned space flight. This man in the corner is. Uh, Jim, two questions. One, uh, with the uh, situation of using the lithium hydroxide in the little module, will there be any chance that the air might get uh, stuffy at all before this is out? And could you paint a picture for us of what it's like in the command module with it powered down? Uh, what, what does uh, Swigert, whoever's in there, see? Is it just the lights from the computer or the disk keep blinking or, or what? Well, we'll, we'll, first let me ask, answer the one about the lithium hydroxide. We'll be using uh, the lithium hydroxide out of the, the LEM and then we'll be using some out of the command module, then some out of the LEM, then some out of the command module, trying to keep the environments in both spacecraft uh, acceptable. Uh, the disk key has been turned off. The command module is powered down now, so there won't be any lights in it at all. We'll be using this, this flashlight. We have three reentry batteries in the command module, and uh, we have no way of recharging these things now with the fuel cells gone, so we don't want to waste any of this uh, valuable electrical power by running unnecessary equipment in the command module. Now, we will, we do have the capability of powering some things in the command module from the LEM as long as we keep this power load down low uh, via the, the umbilical that runs through the tunnel. In a report a, a few moments ago from the Aquarius, they were still having problems with the role and they had not attained the, uh, the configuration that they wanted. My question is, do you know precisely where they are 
and are they on are their computers operable and in tune with yours you talk about perhaps some of the instruments giving you bad readings do you know at this moment precisely where they are oh yes i think we know the trajectory they're on if that is your question yes sir we, we may not know exactly what their alignment uh, is i think that we were fairly well satisfied that the csm and the limb were properly aligned with each other before we shut down the csm is there a hole that uh, was caused by this? I don't think we know that. As far as the, uh, we know where the limb is, but it doesn't know where it is because when we went in there and powered it up, we only went through that part of the power-up procedure that brought the IMU on the line in, in a known configuration. All that equipment, uh, all that erasable memory that has to do with where it is, isn't in there, and the limb really doesn't navigate normally between the Earth and the Moon anyway, so. We're going to have to keep track of it from the ground. And the main thing is the, the LEM provides the attitude with respect to the stars, and that's the uh, uh, reference with, which we'll use for all uh, our maneuvers. I think we're very anxious to get back to work, so we're going to take about two or three more questions and then, and then cut it off. So Chris, I know this is very early to answer this kind of question, but Project Apollo had a pretty uh, carefully thought out lineup of things that you wanted to do. You curtailed it uh, from by eliminating flight number 20. Now, for practical purposes, you've eliminated flight number 13 as far as lunar exploration is concerned. Can you give us any idea at all what this breakdown is going to do to the rest of the program? Well, I'm sure that we will reassess the landing sites uh, that have been chosen. We'll reassess the command service module itself. We want to satisfy ourselves that uh, we've done the best we can before we launch again. Uh, I believe that uh, in terms of the landing sites, we, we will probably reconvene and uh, go through our landing site selection again to make sure we're satisfied that that is true. I think we've done that enough now, however, that we can probably come pretty close to, to laying out the sites that we'd like to go to. Would you, would you think that the six-month hiatus between shots that you've laid out for yourself now would be sufficient to get a handle on what was wrong with the service module and correct it? Or do you think that there might be a delay, a stretch out as a result of that? Well, I think that's very difficult to, to answer, Bill. Uh, let me say this. I don't think we would hesitate to wait a longer period of time than six months if we were not satisfied. The uh, dip spurn that has been referred to, would that have to occur behind the moon out of radio contact or could you fix it so that you could perform it in radio contact it, it could be in radio contact uh, possibly Here. on the uh, backup systems the way the various backup systems as far as moving into the limb and the uh, the various systems that have backed themselves up to the emergency systems are you satisfied with the way they've worked and is this giving you an insight into things that might be needed in in, uh, in future flights, even more backup systems uh, that would back up some of these possibly that have now failed. Well, <clears throat> the command and service module was designed to be an independent spacecraft, and we built the redundancy into the spacecraft. This was whatever happened today was one of those cases that's very difficult to design for. We had uh, something happen, which was a major. Uh, consequence down in the, that bay, I think, because of the, of the multitude of things that occurred when you lose two fuel cells and an oxygen tank and a, the oxygen runs out of the other and all that. That's something very significant. It would be very difficult to design against that. We are fortunate that we're on the way to the moon with the LEM on board, or LEM attached. So I wanted to ask about, uh, you say that on the return flight this could have been extremely critical. Uh, are you thinking now in terms of something to do in the event this should occur on a return flight? I think that would be uh, pretty near uh, impossible to do at this time with that vehicle. If we're here and then we're going to take Mary, then we're going to have to close it up. Did the fact that you went into a hybrid trajectory yesterday pulling you out of free, free return, is that going to cause you any troubles in trying to get back around the moon? No, as I said earlier, we're not on a free return right now, but it's it, it would only take a maneuver of about 20 to 40 feet per second to get you back on a free return. That could be done in, say, five or ten hours from now if we chose to do that. Uh, Chris and Jim, uh, do you have any feeling of how the crew feels and also uh, Marilyn and Mary on this situation? Uh, I, 
it. I would only guess that the crew feels that uh, the situation is under control, that, uh, that they were in a serious condition and they, they uh, knew they had a job to do and I don't think they stopped to consider what their personal feelings were at the moment. Uh, you'll have to wait and see how they felt about it themselves. As far as uh, the, the wives are concerned, I'm sure uh, Deke Slayton has talked to them, but we have not. I, th I think in, when you're in a, a spot like that where you're busy and you have a lot of things to do, uh, I think you just go ahead and do them. And the, the crew's been jumping back and forth between spacecraft and firing systems up and down and, and maneuvering around quite ably in the spacecraft. And they've had the situation well in hand. So I think they've been probably too busy to sit back and Certainly sit. they have remained uh, very calm and uh, responsive to uh, the discussions from the ground. And uh, I'd say they're, they have the situation well under control. We're going to continue to schedule these briefings throughout the mission whenever there's a point where we think interpretation would help and uh, we'll be back again, but I think we ought to get back to mission control now.